Oh, and everyone's got quiet again when I said the same as we're due yesterday. Yes. Okay, so let's finish this lecture, then we're going to go to lunch. Hey, that sounds pretty good. And then we'll talk about PLSQL after lunch. So I'm not going to start from the beginning, don't worry. I'm going to pick up where I left off. And I was going through an example, actually. And the example was going to be in terms of optimizing JDBC, just to see it, how it works, put it into perspective. We talked about the cursor already. We talked about the results set. We talked about is null, database time, optimizing prepare statements. So the second part here is actually kind of interesting, optimizing JDBC. So it won't be too long, actually. It's just going to be a short little ending here on the lecture. So to illustrate the techniques, the goal of the second part is to illustrate the techniques of optimizing JDBC API-based calls for the Java platform and to design better JDBC implementations and recognize potential performance bottlenecks so that we can actually you know, put this to some good use. So we'll look at why we need to optimize basic API techniques, design strategies, and then advanced database tuning methods. So why do we need to optimize? Because if we don't optimize, it runs too slowly and no one's going to use our program and we're going to get fired or one way or the other. So we have to make it good. So on average, a web request performs four database queries per transaction. So there's four database queries. But that's a lot of queries. So if you don't think about the optimization component, your application might be well designed and it might connect properly, but it's not necessarily going to perform like it should. So experience has shown that the database calls are typically performance bottlenecks and database problems create network and database bottlenecks, both in turn. Can we please um, lower the volume a little bit? I'll just wait for you to get done talking. Thank you. All right, so bad JDBC can overwhelm the database, actually. Um, so can not using JDBC or using something else as well. So. So here's the API. So we have the most versatile versus the most optimized. So the more optimized we make it, the less flexible it is and the harder it is to actually work with, which is kind of a trade-off. In terms of SQL, we can do a select star from a table as an example. And we can use a prepared statement, a callable statement, or cache the data on the client. When we cache data, what ends up happening is we end up having to restore or refresh that data because if we don't, the data becomes stale and stale data is almost as bad as no data at all. Especially, if, for example, you're calculating data to keep track of a total in a shopping cart. And the items in the shopping cart keep changing, and then you're using a calculation on the wrong total, which is going to essentially be an issue, <laughs> you know, of course. So there's a catch between uh, where are you going to cache and are you going to be able to cache it. And then we also have the, um, to consider through the API the SQL statements that we're going to use. We have the most flexible, we have the re least reliable kind of components. We also must uh, recompile in a database for each one of our uses. So what ends up happening is the design of our SQL statements can cause significant bottlenecks, depending upon how often we're running them and then what the statement's actually doing. If we run, for example, a statement that says, you know, select star from this database where, you know, or don't even use a where, just go select star from this database. What ends up happening is we get like too many records. And are we really going to use all this stuff? And you might think, well, this is kind of stupid stuff. You know, it's the kind of obvious stuff, right? Um, I've actually gone out and looked at databases and applications that people have written and to try to fix problems for, for clients. And then I get, I, I, how often I see select star. It's like, wow, why are you selecting everything? You know, why in the world do you need everything? Because people are like, oh, if we don't select everything, we might have something we need that we're not going to use. And what ends up happening is like their, their, their database runs so slowly because the queries are just selecting everything. Every time someone runs a query, it's selecting everything instead of just first name and last name or something. The traffic is horrendous. It's just way too time consuming. And then they have a bunch of stuff on the client machine that takes a long time because they have this result set that has everything in it instead of just the first name and the last name, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the other problem I usually see is they don't use views. Instead, they'll have a HR program running from the HR table, <laughs> which is as insecure as you could possibly get in terms of uh, security for you know payroll, social security number, addresses, and stuff. So, using a view, optimizing the query, not getting everything is probably a smart way of optimizing just naturally. You can also use the prepared statement, as I've been talking about this morning. So, representing a pre-compiled SQL statement, so we don't have to keep recreating one. 
can be used to efficiently execute statements with multiple times over and over again. Somewhat flexible, can create new ones as needed um, if we're going to, going to essentially um, change the statements. Here's an example where we've made a prepared statement and the prepared statement's going to be on a, running on a connection and it's going to update employees and set salaries equal to something where ID is equal to something. And then we're going to say, and this is the object that we created, this prepared statement object dot set big decimal dot set integer execute, which means set all the information and execute the query. Set all the information and execute the query. So it's a great way of speeding it up. It's amazing how many people don't use the prepared statement, actually. They just use a create statement. And then uh, a create statement 20 times in a row. <laughs> a lot easier to use a prepared statement and just send the data 20 more times. You know, send the statement once. So, uh, Long story short, the more queries you run, the slower the database. The slower the database is for everybody else, especially if you have multiple clients connected all running the same queries over and over again. We also have the callable statement used to execute the SQL stored procedures that might exist. And we have this uh, same syntax that might be used as a prepared statement. Um, and uh, it's least flexible because it's kind of hard set. Most optimized database call, however, um, because callable statements are ones that we can cache. Sort of like stored procedures. And then people don't, a lot of people don't know or haven't, you know, basically ventured out into the concept of stored procedures. But those are just little programs you're going to write. You're going to store it on the server side so that you can just call it when you need to do it. Because instead of just sending in a statement that says, you know, do this query, join this table with that table, and do all this stuff, right, that's time consuming, and then you're sending it over and over again. If you write a stored procedure, put that on the database, and then just call the stored procedure. <laughs> all, the stuff, all the work's pretty much done for you, and it's doing it on the database, and you're optimizing, again, the performance of the database. So... Um, optimization is a must these days. If you don't optimize your system, it's essentially not going to be very competitive. I mean, with all the other systems out there, it's going to run slower and it's not going to perform correctly. And sometimes it's not going to perform at all, depending upon the design. We also have the cache to consider. So you can keep data within the client to reduce the number of round trips to the database. If you do that, that's what I was saying before, you can't cache everything. You can only cache temporary values, as an example. If you cache, let's say, for example, usernames and, I don't know, things that users are searching on, might make more sense in terms of the overall design. Um, if you're caching totals, not so good. Or money, stuff like that. Lesson, the less database JDBC used, the, the better. Um, you don't want to continuously use it. In fact, you just want to use it when you need to use it. So you can query up, or, you know, queue up your database connectivity commands, run them. And then if you don't need them, don't run them. <laughs> and you don't optimize that as well. So in the old days, you know, database applications you used to wait. Like the database application loaded up and you just waited for it to connect. It's like, why connect until you actually have to connect? So now you can use applications that don't connect until you need to, which is probably a better way of doing it as well. So you use database connect connection pools. So remember the example I gave you before. You've got an iPhone and you're out there on the sales floor and you're trying to ring a customer up. Are you going to sit there and wait? Okay, hold on, I have to connect to the database. <laughs> wait a minute, I have to set my application. No, they just whip out their phone and they attach to a connection pool that's already been established. And they go, okay, what do you want? Scan your stuff. Okay, here you go. What's your email address? And then you just process the transaction. So don't use the database manager get connection over and over and over again. Instead, the database management uh, can take well, actually, if you're using a connection, it could take up to two seconds to create it, maybe, you know, half a second to two seconds. That's, you know, if you're, like, sitting there on the same site running it at the same server. What if you're doing a remote connection? What if you have bad weather? You know, something, you know, is going to affect the connectivity. So you can create a pool of connections and then keep reusing them over and over again. So you constantly have open connections to the database, and the JDBC drivers are connecting to those already established connections and you're using them over and over so that you can optimize the uh, and reduce the amount of time to actually establish a connection. Also reduces the workload on the server and reduces the workload on the database. So it's a necessity for any production system. Yeah, any, you're not going to you know, create a connection constantly. In fact, what ends up in the morning, usually in most retail stores, you know, when you turn on and you initialize the registers, 
Well, that register program is established in the connection pool, and then it takes about five minutes, and then, okay, systems are ready, let's open up our doors, right? And then you constantly transaction after transaction after transaction all day, and then you close the connection at night when you close down the system, which is kind of the design of the application, which is how it should sort of, you know, work to make it more efficient. So basic design techniques, so using multiple threads, threading with connections. So Java does threading, so you can create threads with connections, create multiple threads, pools to address network latency as well. Pooling. Threads can uh, issue queries over separate database connections. And some improves performance to a certain point. So basic design techniques, we have a single batch transaction, so we can collect a collect a set of operations and submit the transaction in this one statement. So that's what I was saying before, queuing it up or pooling it up so that we can just take this entire transaction and run it all at the same time instead of going, okay, customer wants this, so it goes and it updates this. So customer wants that. Every time, if you, every time you clicked on something, which is kind of like the design of the shopping cart, shopping cart says, you know, it's a temporary thing that just sits on your computer usually run in the form of JavaScript or an applet or something, or you know, it might be another script name, like PHP or something. Well, long story short, nothing gets sent to the server. There's no connection. Nothing goes on until you want to check out. Then when you check out, you're going to do this. You're going to do a batch. You're going to begin the transaction, update this table, update that table, insert this, and you know, within two seconds, the transaction is going to be cleared, hopefully. And so you're sending it all at once, and then you're going to commit, and then you're going to disconnect. So you're not, and which is really... Basically, you know, believe it or not, shopping carts are to do this. <laughs> Fill up the cart. Now let's check out. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to run all this stuff. In fact, sometimes when, when you end up checking out, you go, oh, I'm sorry, this one's not in stock. And that one's not in stock either. This one's back ordered. Or this is not available. You don't find out any of those items are actually in stock. Depending upon how, the, how quickly the inventory is updated on the website, you might not actually, you know, be able to actually determine it until you check out. Well, the concept of checking out is an artificial way of optimizing the database connectivity, if you think about it, so. Which is why it's designed that way, which is kind of interesting, because people just go, oh, yeah, shopping cart, don't we need a shopping cart? <laughs> it's become a design technique for everybody, and nobody really understands why, or not everybody understands why. So single batch transactions as well, so database might obtain necessary locks on rows and tables using a release, release them in one step. So depending upon the transaction type, separate statements and commits can result in more database calls and the whole database locks longer. Well, that's why people have done the timeouts. So when you're ordering tickets, you're ordering seats on a plane, you can't spend forever doing your transaction. In fact, I said sometimes I feel pressured. It says, well, you have, you have, five, you have two minutes to complete this transaction. Oh no, and I'm searching around for my credit card, and I'm like, you know, oh my god, my transaction is going to expire. I have to start all over again. Well, the thing is, there, there, there's a lock on that database. That's another word for, hey, we've locked the record on our database, and nobody can access it right now, so hurry up and get your transaction done so we can unlock this table. Otherwise, you're holding the system up for everybody. So, of course, if they said that, I wouldn't be rushing around. I'd be hey, I'll just hold it up for everybody. So. Basic design techniques in terms of don't have the transaction span user input. Well, that's why the shopping cart came around. So transaction's not going to wait for the user to enter something. It shouldn't. Uh, so the application sends a begin transaction and then an SQL locking the tables and the rows in the tables for an update. And then the application waits for the user to press a key before committing a transaction. Not such a good design, especially when the user decides, oh, you know what, I'm just going to go to lunch. <laughs> and meanwhile, you have the open connection and you have the transaction halfway done and the database is going to be sitting there locked until you get back from lunch, perhaps. Smart queries, another way of optimizing the database. Make queries as specific as possible, as I was saying before, never go a select star. There's really, why are you going to select everything from something, unless you actually have to select everything? Make more logic into the SQL statements, minimize the joins, create views, a lot of different techniques you can use with SQL. Databases are designed to use SQL efficiently. Proper use of SQL can avoid performance problems for the most part, usually. So here's some basic design techniques, smart queries. As an example, get employees in the engineering department. 
instead of doing select star from employees, select star from department, and then joining on a database application side, you could do this. You could go select employees, star from employees E, department D, where department number is equal to employee number, and department type equals the department type is equal to engineering. So what you're doing here is sort of like what we were doing last time we met for the first weekend of the course looking at how to optimize the SQL statements to put the join in there and put all of the information. So you're not running two queries. This becomes apparent in terms of the need to do this. It becomes very apparent when uh, you start using database connectivity techniques and you start working with remote databases where this is two calls to the database, two separate queries, and then you're using Java to put the results together. It's amazing how many people will do this because they don't want to write this but the cost of running the one query and actually doing it this way to optimize what you're getting back is less than the cost of running two queries and then spending the processing time in Java to put the results together. So that's a basic technique as well. So you don't have to learn, in fact, there's no way of actually predicting all of these different techniques. What you're going to find out is, how can I make the fewest number of SQL statements and how can I make the statements as powerful as possible to get just the information I want out of the database? So, without just getting everything and then dealing with it on the application side. Because if I went and let's say, well, let's just get all students at ITU, query is probably going to take, you know, probably about four or five minutes to run. And then I'm going to have like all this data that I'm going to have to sort through. When all I really want is just one student out of the entire population. So, anyway. That's the point. Basic design here, smart queries minimizing the results set before crossing the network. And many performance problems come from moving raw data around needlessly. Sending data to, sending an update to the database when no updates needed. Because you can check, in fact, people do this all the time. In fact, applications do this all the time. And I wonder, why in the world do they just check it? So you have a, you know, the database did a query and it populated a form. It says, would you like to change your address? You could just click on, you know, save, save, save like 20 times, but you already saved it. Every time you hit that save button, it's running a query. <laughs> but if nothing has changed on the form, why should it save it again? But that would require the programmer to write a little script in there to say, has anything changed? <laughs> Actually check the form to see if something has changed. If nothing's changed, it should say, nothing's changed. Because maybe you thought you changed your telephone number, but you didn't change the number. Or if it's just the number that changed, send the number. Update on the number rather than updating the entire customer record. And then, you know, having the problem of maybe making a mistake. So use the database for filtering. Use the, the, the Java for the business logic. And it does filtering. database does filtering very well, actually, through queries for the most part. And uh, database business logic is... Uh, is usually poor, so the business logic should be done in the database side, excuse me, it should be done on the application side or the Java side. So using the programming interface, the application interface for what it's good for, using the database for what it's good for, gives you the better combination for efficiency, long story short. So at least very, uh, for, in terms of the business logic, databases are very inconsistent between database vendors in terms of what kind of business logic you can put in there. Which brings up another good point, actually, about Oracle. Oracle tries to have business logic in terms of its packages. So you get Oracle reports and Oracle forms and Oracle designer and all these other add-on products that some people actually use and some people don't. So you're going to use these products if you don't like programming in a traditional programming language or you're trying to make use of their Oracle financials, business products that have business logic in them. So you're buying the business logic as an extra component. Not really part of the database in terms of the database design and the database architecture, but works with the database, just like Java would work with the database or anything else that would work with the database. So that's where all these vendor packages come into place. But I have to admit, though, some of them are really good. In fact, uh, Crystal Reports, excellent reporting module, works with a JDBC or an ODBC interface creates really nice reports, but why do I want to reinvent the wheel? Why do I want to create my own report formats and do everything manually when I can load on a crystal reports module and instantly, oh, I want this left 
justified. I want this right justified. I want this, you know, these headers to repeat. And it does it all for me automatically. Well, that's what the Oracle financials and the Oracle web server and the Oracle, all these little packages you can get. Our third-party programs are going to automate the whole thing for you. And they're optimized for Oracle, which is why people like them. Very, very expensive. And it takes a lot of training to get up to speed on them. It's not quite as easy as picking up crystal reports and running a report. These programs, you can actually go to like a couple weeks for designer, a couple weeks for the forms. There's a million of these little products, and then every year they change them with the database. So your investment in training doesn't really pay off for you either. So not in the long run. So keep operational data sets small as possible, as well as another performance technique. Um, so move non-current data to other tables and do joins for rare historical queries. Well, that's what I would do if I were managing the ITU database as an example. Current students with graduated students or previous students. You know, so you archive and you have different tables with different years perhaps where you have 2012 table and then you have 2009. Chances are the 2009, 10, 11, 12, those students aren't here anymore. Those students are graduated. That's three years ago. Eh, who knows, some of them still might be here. But there's a likelihood that if the student is like from three or four years ago, they don't need to be in the current student table. So if you keep everything together, it makes the database too big. You archive it out. Every university you go to, they'll ask you, you know, you want to order a transcript. They'll say, what year did you graduate? Because then it tells them what archive table you're in. <laughs> because it's not all going to be in the current student table. You're going to be moved. Because why should your data be blogging down, holding down the query speed? and causing a bottleneck for all of the other students. Where we could just move you aside and say, okay, you graduated. You don't need to be in the registration table anymore. You don't need to be in this table anymore. So <clears throat> that and keeping students, and there was one student here, multiple student IDs. You know, that's like multiple entries in the same database. <laughs> that's duplicated data. That's bad data. Yeah. So keeping one entry for one student is not a bad idea either. <clears throat> so otherwise, um, Index or cluster, so frequently used data is logically and physically organized, which is why indexing works. So we talked about indexing at the last meeting, but that was about a month or so ago. And I said you could take a data that is a database table that's completely populated with data and run an index on the table. And then you take the index and you use it for querying. And then I probably also mentioned, I hope, that um, when you create a primary key in a table, it's automatically indexed if you have the feature turned on. So you automatically have an index on every one of your primary keys. Not your foreign keys, but you can put manual indexes on foreign keys in tables. So if you have an archive table and it's of students from 2005 or something, you, then you could create an index on the student ID and then you have a fast lookup. So all you're doing is querying that table on the student ID. Who is that student? Oh yeah, here you go. Print the report out for their transcript. <laughs> Here you go. Print the, and you can optimize the querying and the entire application of that data by optimizing it through an index on the table. So maybe, you know, in the past it wasn't the index on the student ID. Maybe the index is going to be on the graduation year. You know, what year did you graduate? And then you go and you query the table. Okay, here are all the people that graduated in 2009. Okay, what student ID is this? And then it's a faster lookup by year that maybe it's not part of an, any type of key on the table. Uh, so let's see, it makes it move faster. So special options for each one of the JDBC drivers as well. A lot of people play around with what vendor made the driver. Make the driver small, make the driver faster, which is kind of interesting. So Oracle makes Oracle, or not really. Well, actually Sun makes Oracle, but and long story short, or is it? Oracle makes sun now. I don't know. Long story short, a vendor made the database, uh, and the vendor is optimizing the database access, and they're going to make it meet their, their needs. We have other vendors out there who work with developing software for you know, different platforms, and they're going to make their own drivers that are going to optimize the performance on their platform. So people invest a lot of time in trying to figure out, well, let's get the most efficient driver because it's actually like anything, especially Windows, it's all driver based. If you have a bad driver, slow access. The drive, the CD-ROM drive runs slowly or the, you know, because of the driver. It's the driver interface that's controlling the speed. 
Same thing with JDBC and ODBC. Update the drivers, find drivers from vendors who are optimizing things. So most of the open source free drivers are slow. <laughs> they're not, they're, no one has spent a lot of time for optimizing them. They're not integrated very well. Not to say that they're not all bad. In fact, there's a ton of free ones out there that work quite well. Or you can have a custom driver made or pay for a vendor to create a better driver interface for you to optimize it for your application purpose. If you're a bank and you're a huge multi-million dollar bank, you can afford a couple thousand dollars for a custom made driver to make your transactions run five minutes faster per customer, <laughs> which is a significant change. Especially if you have a big long line at the bank and you want to make sure your tellers can process things as fast as possible, you're going to optimize the driver interface, and you're going to optimize the application so that, and it's all database related. Every single one of those teller machines is connected to a database, main server bank database that's not in the California or not at the bench. The database is not in the building, the database is elsewhere. And they're using some sort of database driver interface to connect. So you're going to put money into research or into developing of custom-made, optimized drivers. There's no common standard, as the slide says. Nope. And improve performance by reducing round trips to the database. Example, Oracle driver performance extensions can also be installed. So you can use standard drivers, and then you can put in extension packages or extension modules to increase the performance of that. So, which is kind of weird, but there's no standard in it, so you can configure it any way you want. So. In terms of some more advanced driver tuning, Oracle performance extensions come in a couple of different varieties. We have row prefetching and batch updates. So, in terms of the row prefetch, use a client-side buffer to get all of the information and buffer it while the client's trying to decide what they want to search on. Or after they've decided what they want to search on, don't get rid of it, buffer it locally. Uh, replace round trips by local manipulation of the rows returned by the query. That's when it makes sense to do a select star, because you want to buffer as much information as possible, put it on the client side, forget about going back to the server for a while until the client's ready to commit. So your shopping cart is sort of doing that. You're going to take the inventory, you're going to log in to the site, you're going to get a current capture of all the inventory items and everything that's available from the website. You're going to log into your account, or you're going to keep a temporary session going on with your shopping cart. You're going to add stuff to it. You're going to do everything, and it's all going to be cached on the client side until you hit purchase or checkout. And then that's going to take you to the server, and then on the server, that one round trip to the server is going to optimize, and it's going to be able to essentially um, run everything all in one shot as fast as possible, which is the concept of that shopping cart. Um, so also looking at using Oracle statements to set the row fit prefetch in terms of uh, built-in. And that's the other thing that JDBC is going to give you. It's going to give you the optimization for the extensions that you can install. So you can load the extension, create an instance of that module, run it, and uh, you know basically have it all in one house all in one program and not have to go between different programs. Because another thing that makes, and this is not, I haven't mentioned it yet, I forgot to mention it actually a little bit earlier. Another way to optimize the performance of your application running with the database is to close the loops and minimize the number of applications that are connecting to the database. And what does that mean? Not get rid of scripting, but reduce the amount of scripting you're doing. You don't want to pull from this system over here and then pull from this system over here and add all the data together and then put it in your application and then send that over to another server. Those are like the, you know, the scripting stuff that goes on. It's better to just do one here. You know, from here to here to here to here. Just do it right here in the application. So the application has everything installed in it and has access to everything inside of itself and there's no scripting. There's no patching this system to work with this system to work with that. So the more patching you do, the slower your system is going to run. So a lot of consultants come in and they get rid of the patching. They say, well, why, how come you're not running this on the database server? And you're like running it right next to the database server. How come you didn't put that on the same database server? Why, why are you using that? In fact, what ends up happening is as a consultant, you come into a company and says, well, 10 years ago, someone bought this program that we've been using. 
So every night, someone takes a printout from this program, and in the morning, the TAs come in, and they enter it all into this program over here. Actually, believe it or not, we're doing that. We have two separate programs at this company. If they would just take and merge the two of them together, the system would run faster. And then you'd also have more consistency with data. But that's part of growing, and every company does that. You start out with small systems, and then you get the bigger systems, and then you realize, well, this system over here was really good at this, and this one over here doesn't do that. Now you're scripting to transport data from this system to this system, or to use both systems together with another system. That's a bottleneck right there. So performance, rewrite it so it's all on one system, all on one, one network, one system. Huh? Oh, totally. In general. Correct. It's just the sheer number of connections to that database. Even if you're not querying, you're not doing anything, the connection is going to deteriorate your network traffic speed. There's still data. Just to establish a connection, there's data that's flowing and that's maintaining constant connection. You don't say it explicitly because you're not running it, not using it, but you know how many databases actually go, they connect, they keep a, like a TCP connection open? and it just stays open. And it's like, why don't you just close that connection? So a lot of people don't close a connection in an application. They just design the application. So then you get garbage. You get all of these open connections that have never been closed. That slows the database down because for each one of the open connections, there's information stored on the server and there's management on the database end of it to keep track of those connections. But you're keeping track of people who aren't here. It's like the scenario I gave you earlier when, you know, you call in for support 99 times and there's 99 buttons lit up, but it's all you and you've hung up all those other times and you really only have one connection that's really current, but the other person's like, hold on, hello, oh, nobody in there, hello, nobody there, I'm sorry, hello, nobody there, until the 99th connection comes, oh, here you are, and you just basically created more traffic for yourself. Actually, that happens still today. People call in, I'm hold. You know how many times you hung up? Let's see, those systems are now smart. They do detection. They go up, deadline. Close that one. Close that one. Close that one. It takes a few minutes for the call to drop. But if you've ever worked on one of those automated, you know, those PBX systems. In the old days, they just stayed lit. And you had to connect it. Oh, nobody there. Nobody there. Nobody there. Now they just drop them off. Because people would call in multiple times. Because, you know, what happens, you know, if the person's on the phone, the person's on the phone. But they want to make sure that they're the next person. So, anyway. Same thing with the database. The more connections you have, has to, are you there? Are you there? No, you're not there. You're not there. And a database has to spend time and resources to go see if anyone's still connected. And then some databases, actually, depending upon how sophisticated the DBA is, you might set a maximum on the number of connections. And if the maximum is 50 and you have 49 empty connections that are not being used that are still open and active, then you only have one connection possible <laughs> for your entire application, which is not going to be enough in some cases. Uh, so data reverse, uh, what is this? Batch updates. So reverse, there was the reverse of prefetching. So instead of getting all the stuff ahead of time and caching it on the client, instead you're going to do the opposite. You're going to collect all the client information that you need, which is how the shopping cart's working. It's a batch update. You're going to collect all the stuff you need, then you're going to connect to the server, and then you're going to send all the stuff to the server, and then you're done. There's no open connection. How many of these do we have? So it's the application design. You're delaying all of the analysis until the very end, which is great because people love shopping carts because, you know, what if you just change your... In fact, I've done this a lot too. Change my mind. Well, you know what? I'll just do this later. <laughs> I haven't wasted any server resources by shopping, by adding stuff, you know, by reserving anything. Instead, I can just keep it. In fact, sometimes you can just go back to the same website and go, hey, look, there's still stuff in the cart. Do I want that stuff? And then I can decide if I want it. So the data, does the data going to the database, what prefetches data does for data coming from it? So it's the same as the opposite order. So Oracle prepares statements, set, execute, batch. We'll take and save up all of your statements so that you can just send them all in one batch. So standard JDBC makes a trip to the database for every one of the prepared statements on an execute update. Execute update is the slowest update you could possibly do. 
So instead you batch them manually and then you send one execute update. So in terms of batching, when the number of queued requests reaches a batch size, send them to the database. It's like if you're working on an application, for example, and you're a bank teller and you are um, updating people's addresses or doing deposits. Actually, that's a, that's a good thing. You know, you have a whole line of 50 people. It's their lunch hour and they all want to try and do a deposit right now. So instead of depositing each one of them after each one of the transactions, the banks usually do it twice a day. They'll do it at 3 o'clock and they'll do it at midnight. And it's called a batch update, where their terminal is saving up all that stuff. Oh, here's a deposit. Here's a deposit. Your account's not being updated. <laughs> Your account won't get updated till probably about 3 o'clock. They do it late afternoon, and then they do it at midnight because there's a check. So at 3 o'clock, when they do the pre-batch update, it's a, it, they have a window to reverse and a window to correct problems before the midnight update occurs. Because what happens if a check bounces or what happens if something, you know. So they have that window of, of do we really want to commit this today kind of thing and it holds on things and they have some flexibility. And then they wait till midnight or 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning because there's no internet traffic at that time in the United States. It's empty. And they can sit there and the, the bank system will update to the national system for two to three or four hours constantly. So they need to make sure that there's low traffic going on, and so they can, you know, make it slowly so they can put checks in to make sure everything is synchronized correctly and everything's going to work. And then if it fails, they still have a couple more hours in the night before the morning wakes up. So usually about 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning, the system is actually done and available, <laughs> depending upon when they're going to release it. And then when they release it, everything gets updated. So an all reconciliation occurs at that particular time. So. That's a batch update. So every time you go to the bank and you deposit something in, it doesn't hit your account. <laughs> not going to hit your account till midnight, really. But your statement's going to say, hey, look, it hit my account. I have the money. Actually, what most banks do is they try to leverage themselves a little bit. They'll make, you know, $100 available immediately. And then if that $100 works, then at midnight the rest of it's available. So it's a much better deal than having none of it available. But uh, I don't believe there's any bank out here in California that will do an instant make all those funds available unless you put cash in. <laughs> if you put cash in, there's no reconciliation. They can update it right now. But checks, they're going to be batch updated, and they're going to be all in one processing. And it's going to take two or three hours for all that stuff to work. So a little summary on the optimization strategies that I've given you. Uh, leveraging the strengths of the database. Having the database do what the database is good for, which is another point I forgot to make when I talked about stored procedures. It's nice to be able to take and put something on the server, store it there, and then just call it. And what is a stored procedure? It's like a series of SQL statements. It can be written in SQL. It doesn't have to be, though. It can be written in a procedural language. It can be written uh, as a, and just think of it more of it as a functionality, as a function can happen on updates, you know, when something is updated, it can happen automatically on the server. So you don't have to send a command from your application to the server to do this. It can just happen on its own, which is why a lot of people put triggers in there. A trigger is another thing. A trigger might say, if, for example, you're Wells Fargo or my bank, USA, I keep using Wells Fargo because I bank with them, actually, but <laughs> it's the only bank name I can come up with. Okay, so my bank, Acme Bank, Inc., and you uh, have... Uh, you know, customers have uh, overdraft protection, right? Why let the application have to figure all that stuff out? You know, if you let the application figure out overdraft protection, you got to go check the balance. Well, that's one call. Well, that's one connection to the database. Okay, bring the information back to the client. Okay, go, okay, now perform the transaction. Okay, update the database. Okay, check the database again. Is the account negative? Oh, it's negative. Okay, so get the balance on the overdraft. Put the, you know, make sure you can withdraw from that balance, put it in the other balance. That's a lot of processing. So you write a trigger and you put it on the balance so that when the updated original account gets balanced, you have a stored procedure that runs on the trigger that takes and does all that stuff on the server for you automatically with no processing on the client side. Which can also do checks to see, you know, are you going to be over withdrawn? Or, and then that's the stuff that's going to be doing the transfer. So when you're sitting there and you're going, well, transfer this money from this account and put it in that account. And you press go, right? 
And you come back and says, oh, look, it's transferred. Nothing's happened. <laughs> Nothing's happened until midnight. <laughs> but you look at it and go, oh, look, now I have the money there. Well, the money's there. The money's not there. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. Because at midnight, the server's going to do all that stuff for you. It's storing it up, and the server's going to do it. But the application looks like, hey, I just transferred the money. It looks good, right? And it ran like lickety split. You know, no other bank can like transfer that fast, right? <laughs> but usually there's limitations, and it tells you this is not going to be active for four to six hours from now, or the next day. Actually, I think they usually do 24 to 48 hours or something, depending upon that. So just like a wire, when you send wire, you don't really have the wire hasn't cleared for 24 hours after the wire actually has been received. Because nothing has really happened. Nothing has been performed yet. Uh, okay, so you can also use a full range of, uh, and it, the reason why I was bringing up those examples is because you want to use the server for what the server is good for. You want to use the database for what the database is good for, what its strengths are, and then use the application for the, what the application is good for. And then uh, also looking at using a full range of uh, the java.sql API, actually using prepared statement instead of execute statement or create statement, actually using the timeout feature so that the system can timeout. You know how many people, yeah, I've looked at some applications where people have written these elaborate timing programs. You know, it uses the system clock and it goes through and it checks to see and it times it. Well, like when there's a method in the API that will automatically monitor the connection and time it out for you automatically. So it's like any programming language, using the tools that are available to you. And basically familiarizing yourself with the APIs so you can use the tools of the API and not mix with other tools in there as well. It's not a bad idea. Design for performance, connection pools, multi-threading, et cetera. So database application design is one of those things that you can make it run efficient and then you can make it not. It could be a terrible program. And a good example of that, and I know I'm recording this, but I'm like looking up to see who's here, is the EMS. <laughs> I have so many complaints. It's not, it's not as bad as it used to be. That's a classic database application. No performance in mine. <laughs> no usability in mine. The worst, the worst, the worst example I could possibly come up with in terms of efficiency functionality. Uh, however, it's better than it used to be and it's it's still being worked on. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Oh no. Oh good. Yeah. So that we can make it better. So that was the one of the assignments. So I'm not the only one who mouth bad mouth that system. Okay, good. To show that one example we he showed like five well, just as, yeah, actually, yeah, let me tell you, when I was changing and I was deleting those seven in-class assignments, I came up with 19 errors. So the first error was, at one point I deleted it, and then I went back in, and it wasn't deleted. That was, I, I'm not going to go all through 19 of them, but the other one was, okay, so after I deleted it, the points didn't add up correctly, because I removed removing three points at a time. So then it caused a problem with the grading policy. And then it also caused a problem with the other assignments that were associated with the grouping of the category for the assignments. And then it also caused, and I went through and it was 19 things I had to change in order to remove that one thing. And I kept getting these 505 server errors that came up. <laughs> because it was the logic of what I was doing. But that's the user interface. That's the problem. And But it's not only that, but it's the logic associated with user interface and how it's implemented on the database. Way wrong. Because it was changing, it was updating, it was allowing updates to occur singly, which is the other problem I have with the EMS. So I put a grade in for you guys, it shows up automatically. What if the grade's wrong? <laughs> there's no window of batching or anything, there's no batching that happens at all. Every time you do anything, which is why the EMS runs so slowly. Another good example that's applicable to this course is not a complaint, but an example. Every single time a student uploads something, it slows the DMS down for everybody else. Because you're establishing a connection to the database, every single one of you has your own separate connection. And you're all uploading something. And the database is locked during your upload, which is kind of cause a decrease in bandwidth, <laughs> which is why the database used to go down. So all they did was increase the bandwidth, <laughs> but it on a bigger server. 
well, then we have more students. So it's constant, you know, chicken before the egg kind of problem. But the whole design, I mean, it's, anyway, I'm going to stop on that because I can go on for at least 19 more examples of stuff I can point out just from yesterday, actually. So anyway, so that's a good example of how you could fix the system and make a better application out of it by optimizing the database and the concepts associated with it, creating pools. Creating a connection pool might actually be a good idea as well. All right, so implementing a driver performance extensions. If you're using JDBC, they're not, you're not actually using JDBC with that. You're using, a, I think it's WordPress or something, a scripting language actually to connect to the database, which essentially is not the most optimal either. <laughs> because WordPress, and if you're using a scripting language like P PHP, which I believe is the base for WordPress, but don't quote me on that, along with JavaScript and something else, but long story short, every single one of your transactions is a separate connection, which is why sometimes you get those 505 server errors, because the connection failed. <laughs> because everything you're doing is a separate connection. It's not pooled together in a single connection. All right, it's enough harping on that. So It is lunchtime, I believe, as well. So it's 12.07. So let me stop this video.